let us center ourselves and light our candles. God is here all the time. All the time, God is here. All are welcome all the time. All the time, all are welcome. Have you ever had an animal run in front of your car and you put your foot hard on the brakes? You pull over and shake. COVID-19 was the animal that ran in front of us and forced us to put the brakes on. Terrifying as it is, it has forced us to stop suddenly and give up many of our pastimes and rethink our world. From Brené Brown, let us pray. We cannot go back to normal. Normal never was. We normalize greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return. My BUC friends, we are being given an opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all humanity and nature. Let us take COVID-19 and the sudden stop for what it is, a wake up call for change. Amen. Hey everyone out there, we were Genesis, or at least some members who were available. I'm Lauren. I'm Rachel. I'm Nathan. I'm Emma. I'm Rick. And we would like to sing with you and on this path, wherever you may be. One, two, one, two.
<laughs> Real <laughs> what? <laughs> Just long enough so we can edit that out. <laughs> This spring, the BUC makers and the BUC prayer shawl ministry made hundreds of masks and shawls for those in need. These shawls are an outward and visible sign of the mystical reality of prayer that knits souls together in God. Please join me as we bless them. Holy God, may your grace be upon these shawls warming and comforting, enfolding and embracing. May these mantles be a safe haven for those who wear them, a sacred place of security and well-being, sustaining and embracing them in good times and in hard times. May the ones who receive these shawls be cradled in hope, kept in joy, graced with peace, and wrapped in love. We pray these in your name. Amen. Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about the scripture reading of Saul on the road to Damascus. And at the heart of that scripture reading, it's really about change and transformation. So when I was looking at it this week, I was really contemplating change and transformation. But I have to be honest with you, I was already thinking about trans change and transformation long before I started looking at the scripture reading, and I'm going to tell you why. So I don't know what you've been doing while you've been stuck at home, but we've been doing some house cleaning. I think a lot of us have. 
So one of the things that we found was this. So this is my son's first hockey protect chest protector. It's pretty tiny. It's pretty adorable actually. And my son is getting ready, has been going back on the ice. And what we've discovered is that he's grown a little bit since the last time he was on the ice. So we had to buy him a new chest protector. That, of course, wasn't the one that he was just wearing. That was a number of years ago. But this is the new one. This one is huge. Look at it. It's changed a lot. He's changed a lot. He's gone through a lot of physical transformation. And you know what? When we're growing up, physical transformation isn't easy either, right? There's those, he wakes up at night with pains in his ankles, he gets growing pains. But sometimes physical transformations are at least a little bit easier than they are spiritual or inner transformations like Saul goes through. At least we kind of know what to expect when we're going through a physical transformation. So Saul was an angry guy. I don't think there's any other way to describe him. You know, and he was particularly angry at Christians. He wanted to arrest Christians. He treated them poorly, which led to them being imprisoned. And he went and got special permission to arrest Christians on his way um, to Damascus. Because he wanted to, to, you know, imprison and arrest followers of Jesus. So on his way to Damascus, there's this huge bright light that shines out of the sky and knocks him to the ground because he can't see. And then there's this voice that speaks to him and says, why do you persecute me? And Saul, of course, is terrified and covering his eyes from the bright light. And he says, who are you? And the voice says, I'm Jesus. And so Saul says, you know, what am I supposed to do? And Jesus says, go to Damascus and someone will meet you there and tell you what to do. And so Saul gets up from the ground and he uncovers his eyes from the bright light and realizes he's blind. He can't see anymore. And I wonder what that must have been like. The terror, the fear that would have gone along with that, not being able to see. So the people he's traveling with guide him because he can't see anymore to Damascus. And Saul lays there for three days and can't eat or drink and cannot see. At the same time, Jesus comes and visits Ananias, his disciple in Damascus in a dream and says, Ananias, I want you to go and help Saul to see. And Ananias, I'm sure, and he says, thinks that this is a bad idea. He's like, do you know what Saul is like? Because I've heard stories of him, and he's not very good to people who follow Jesus. And, leave. and Jesus is like, no, this is what I want you to do. So Ananias goes, and he lays hands on Saul, and scales fall, they say in, this, in the scripture reading, from his eyes, and Saul can see again, and Saul is transformed. Saul becomes a follower of the way and a follower of Jesus and changes his life and changes other people's lives. And I wonder about this transformation and I wonder about this time. And Saul goes on to change his name and become Paul. It's a really big transformation as you can imagine where he's come from. And I wonder about this time and this place and what's going on and what we're called to do. And it's scary. And I'm sure that Saul was scared. I'm sure when we were small and growing, we were scared. Who are we becoming? What's going on? And it's hurt and it hurts and it's uncomfortable. But beauty comes in transformation too. And that's when I think about the butterfly, you know, the, the caterpillar that goes into a cocoon and emerges as a butterfly. And in some ways, it's almost a bit like cocooning in the last little while as we've been stuck in our houses, you know, wrapped up in some ways in the safety of our homes when we're so lucky. Some of us have not been. Some of us have still had to go out into the big world. And that's, and that's challenging and scary too as we see the transformations around us. But it's interesting to me, right? So I ask myself in this really tough and scary time at some points, who is Jesus calling me to be? What kind of transformation am I going through? What kind of transformation am I going through? Is the church going through? Is my community the bigger world? And as scary as it can be, we can also remember that change and transformation can be beautiful as it was for a butterfly and as it was for Saul. And I wonder if I can be more like Ananias who thought, hmm, not so sure about this thing I'm being asked to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because what happens if he hadn't listened? 
Where would Saul be? Where would we be without Paul? So I'm hoping that I have the faith and bravery to embrace the transformation that's coming my way and that as a church and as a community, we can as well. I look forward to hearing what Katie has to say about this story as well. Good morning. I'm Natalie Moyes. Our reading today draws from the story of Paul, one of early Christianity's most influential disciples and author of many of the epistles of the New Testament. Before he was Paul, he was called Saul, and he was a ruthless overseer of the willful torture and murder of the followers of Jesus. When Saul was persecuting these people, they were not yet called Christians. They were simply followers of the way. In today's reading uh, from Acts 9, we hear not only how Saul was converted to Paul, but how a humble follower of the way, Ananias, was asked by God to be an instrument of grace to a person he feared and reviled. Meanwhile, Saul continued to breathe murderous threats against the disciples of Jesus. He had gone up to the high priest and asked for letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus that would authorize him to arrest and take to Jerusalem any followers of the way that he could find, both women and men. As he traveled along and was approaching Damascus, a light from the sky suddenly flashed about him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? Saul asked. The voice answered, I am Jesus and you are persecuting me. Get up now, go into the city where you will be told what to do. Those traveling with him were speechless. They heard the voice, but could see no one. Saul got up from the ground, unable to see, even though his eyes were open. They had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. For three days, he continued to be blind during which time he ate and drank nothing. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. Christ appeared to him in a vision saying, Ananias, and Ananias said, here I am. Then Christ said to him, go at once to Straight Street. And at the house of Judah, ask for a certain Saul of Tarsus. He is there praying. Saul had a vision that a man named Ananias will come and lay hands on him so that he would recover his sight. But Ananias protested. I have heard from many sources about Saul and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. He is here now with authority from the chief priests to arrest everybody who calls on your name. And Christ said to Ananias, go anyway. Saul is the instrument I have chosen to bring my name to Gentiles to rulers, and to the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he will have to suffer for my name. With that, Ananias left. When he entered the house, he laid his hands on Saul, saying, Saul, my brother, I have been sent by Jesus Christ, who appeared to you on the way here 
to help you recover your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. He got up and was baptized, and his strength returned after he had eaten some food. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days and soon began proclaiming in the synagogues that Jesus was the only begotten of God. May God gift us this day with understanding and wisdom the words we have heard that we may be transformed by their message. Well, good morning, Bedford United Church and everyone who's joining us across Nova Scotia and the Maritimes and Canada. My name is Reverend Katie Avon. I'm the Minister of Congregational Care here at Bedford United, and I'm so delighted that you're here with us today, wherever you are and whenever you are watching. Let's be honest. It's been a lot. A global pandemic, a mass shooting, an undeniable awareness of profound racial injustice, climate change. It's been a lot. It is a lot. And as restrictions began to ease here in Nova Scotia and across Canada, it's tempting to think that we might be getting back to normal, isn't it? Yeah. But let's be honest. There's no returning to what we thought was normal. Whatever comes next will not be what came before. And I don't think we want that anyways. We know on so many levels that our way of living before this was not healthy and it was not sustainable. Moving away from that may be a very good thing. But that doesn't mean it's been easy or it will be. It's been hard. It is hard. I don't think that what happened to Saul on the road to Damascus or to Ananias a few days later was easy for them either. I think it was actually really hard for them. Saul's mission in life unraveled in an instant. His whole identity was stripped away from him in a flash of light, demolished by a voice that confronted him with a truth that he did not know, a truth that left him blind and helpless. Saul was lost for meaning and purpose on that road to Damascus. And you know, he would have stayed that way if it weren't for Ananias. Ananias, on the other hand, was a humble servant of God, ready to respond to God's call. Oh, but not that call. God calls Ananias to go to his worst enemy, the very person who is literally persecuting followers of the way. God calls him not just to go to him, but to lay hands on him. Unable to imagine this, Ananias clarifies to God that this guy is literally killing people like me. And God's response? Go anyways. Ananias and Saul meet each other in difficult, unpredictable circumstances. They are way out of their comfort zone. Their sense of identity is being transformed dramatically. They are even beyond what they can imagine God is doing, what they can imagine God is calling them to. And that sounds a little bit like us right now. A lot of us are outside of our comfort zone. Some of us are way out of our comfort zone. The way that we thought the world worked and who we were in it has been profoundly rearranged in the last few months. It's difficult, to say the least, to keep up with the daily and weekly changes that are happening around us. Like I said before, it's a lot, and it is hard to understand all of it. I wonder, 
if Saul and Ananias felt the way many of us do now, overwhelmed by the changes, cautious of what to do next, unsure of what we're being called to in a world that is changing so quickly around us, a world that will not go back to what it was before. And yet, despite the difficulty and the limits of their imagination, something amazing happens between Saul and Ananias right there in the crucible of hard times, the hardest of times. A profound transformation happens with each other. Enemies are swept up together. Ananias could not imagine that the risen Christ had confronted Saul. Saul could not imagine that God was transforming him from being a persecutor to being an evangelist. I'll tell you, I love this story because this story is trying to broaden our imagination. This story is asking us to expand our vision that we may see what God is up to. This story is asking us to imagine ourselves as indispensable agents of God's transformation, even though we can't always see it. We can't always understand it. This story is asking us to imagine a new way of being that God is calling us to. Can you imagine a new way of being? Can you imagine a faith that isn't part of your identity, but is the core of your identity as it was for followers of the way? Can you imagine your faith as being that which everything in your life flows out of and back to again? Can you imagine being this way? Take a moment. Imagine that. It's time to imagine the way. We need to imagine the way. To Saul, to Ananias, to us, God is saying another way of being is possible Another world is possible, and I am calling you to it. And the good news is that the risen Christ is walking with us on that road. It is time to imagine the way. Thanks be to God.
Good morning, BUC. Like many of you, I long for us to be together in person again, to live and grow in our faith together as a community. And during these last few months, when we've not been able to be together in person, we've still had an amazing way of being together through these online services. I do feel connected seeing the numbers of viewers watching a service increase and knowing that we are all praying and singing and worshiping together at the same time, though distanced apart. It has been a beautiful thing. As a nurse, these last few months have been a difficult and challenging time at work, filled with an increased amount of preparation and planning and stress and anxiety. Added to this has been the collective and communal grief and sadness of our local communities as we have struggled through the loss of jobs, finances and businesses, and the devastating loss of lives through illness, accidents, murder and racism. I've relied on these online worship services and our ministry team to help me stay grounded, comforted, inspired and spiritually fed. Many of your texted comments during the services have also reflected these sentiments, so I know that I am not alone. I also wonder though, am I not alone in being a financial contributor to BUC through envelope giving? I confess that since I was not at church to give by envelope, I just gave nothing at all. I had good intentions of sending an e-transfer or signing up for PAR or dropping off an envelope with missed givings, but I just didn't. This has also made me reflect on my givings pre-COVID-19, wherein if I wasn't at church on a particular Sunday because I was at work or away for the weekend or not attending in the summer months, that meant the church did not receive my contributions. Sadly, this does not reflect in the slightest my appreciation for all that BUC does for me and my family and my community. So after last week's service and watching Matt and Andrea and Nick discuss the new financial campaign, of giving a little, giving often, giving together, I did it. I signed up for the pre-authorized monthly deductions from my bank account. I had an amount of which I had been planning to give monthly and I increased it by another $30 a month to participate in this campaign of an additional dollar a day. With decreased family income because of the pandemic, I do have to decide which essentials get paid during these times. But if I'm honest with myself, BUC is 100% essential in my life. So I need to contribute in this way to play my part in helping our church not just survive through these times, but to thrive in order to keep offering the programming and services that so many of us want and need. So now I am asking each of you to consider how essential BUC is to you and whether you can increase your givings. Can you give a little more? Can you sign up for PAR like me? Can you increase your PAR envelope or e-transfers if you already contribute in that way? Can you give more frequently when you are able? Can we make these givings even more impactful by doing it together? Thank you so much, Tammy. It's amazing to hear and thank you for sharing your story to hear the sense of commitment and dedication and the fact that BUC is one of those things that you want to prioritize in, in your life and your family's life is amazing to hear. So I'm glad the, the campaign resonated with you uh, and you felt like uh, you were in a position to be able to, to make that commitment. That's absolutely awesome. And the really exciting news is that Tammy is just one of 40 households that we heard from this last week up until Thursday. We may have had some new ones come in since then, but 40 households have stepped up um, and increased their givings, either started uh, on par uh, afresh or increased their, their givings through par or through envelopes. That's an amazing response. In just one week, we've added almost $1,200 to our monthly um, income. Over the course of a year, that's over $14,000. New, new dollars that are coming into BUC to help us do the valuable work that we're doing. That's phenomenal. Thank you so, so much to everyone who has heard this campaign, who has felt that the, the opportunity to, to step up, to make that extra contribution. Um, it's, it's really heartening to hear that this message has resonated with so many of you. And all I ask is that for everyone else who's maybe considering, maybe they haven't made that decision yet, maybe they're on the fence thinking, is, is this right for me? 
I hope hearing this response, um, hearing that 40 households have, have already decided to join this cause, maybe that would uh, inspire you to do the same. Um, because I th as we said last week, if we can give often, if we can give a little, if we can give together, great things can continue to grow here at BUC. So thank you so, so much to, to Tammy, to everybody else who has um, stepped up the contribution so far. Let's see where we can go next week. Many thanks. Hi Bedford United. My name is Holly Hagerman and today I'm going to be reading for you the prayers of the community. Oh, Holy Spirit, divine wonder, you who calls us down new and wonderful paths. Your guidance keeps us in awe, though your guidance is also sometimes uncomfortable. Sometimes like in the story of Ananias. You ask us to trust you where our judgment might otherwise disagree. Sometimes what you are asking does not make sense to us. We feel the call of your spirit in our hearts and in our minds. We know what you are asking us to do, but you do not always ask easy things of us. Right now, as we are wrapping our heads around continued racial just injustice, global pandemic, and climate change, you are calling us into the future and calling us to redefine our identities. You are calling us into discomfort, but we know you are also calling us into love. You have called us to do this before. You've called us to make changes to the way we live in Canada by abolishing slavery, segregation, residential schools, and working towards social justice for women and minorities. Yes, we have made changes before, but we hear your call now that it is not enough and that we must do more. Holy One, even when your call forces us outside our comfort zone, help us make the changes that are necessary. Help us to adapt. Dear God, it is time to shed our old identities as pre-pandemic persons. It is time to grow into love and grow into your greater plan for us. Help us discover our new path and help us redefine and rediscover it over and over again as you call us continually to greater things. Help us shed what is no longer helpful to our brothers and sisters around us and shed our own pride when it comes to change. We ask for patience. We ask for wisdom. And we ask for you to open our hearts and to speak through us the words that need to be spoken and act through us the actions that need to be done. In your name we pray. Amen. Before we sing our closing hymn today, I just want to thank Nathan and uh, Lauren and Emma and Rachel for leading those most of the songs with me today. It was just awesome. And uh, it was my first time having some volunteers in the building with me making music. So we took our time being careful and, uh, and uh, far apart from each other and wore our masks except when we did the recording. 
and it was really special to be here with four of the band anyway. There's more, but they weren't available. So thanks to them, our closing hymn today, I the Lord of Sea and Sky. Welcome everybody to the crossing. You can see the deck behind me. That was built. Come a little further towards the sign. There's a fire pit. Right here there's a little bench you can sit on. And there's the pizza oven itself. Landscaping's going on. It's almost done. If you haven't driven by, please do. It's looking really nice and a lot of us that put a even a little bit of work into it are really excited. As we leave today's service, as we continue to live in a world full of change and uncertainty, may you be blessed with the assurance of God's guidance along the way. And may you always know that God's Spirit empire, empowers you to be changed, that we may bring the, the love and hope of God to everyone you meet. Amen and Namaste.
Hi, it's uh, Sandy and Sue Withers. We're members of the Celebration Singers at uh, BUC. And uh, we'd like to just do a little farewell thing for Liz and her husband. Um, and I guess we're going to start off. And uh, Liz, um, I always enjoy your laugh and, uh, and your little digs sitting in front of me. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate all your talent, Liz, beautiful voice. Uh, ukulele um yeah and you'll you'll be sorely missed and liz um thank you so much for all you've done for this choir for cantata choir for leading alto sectionals so many times at cantata thank you for being on our worship and ministry worship and music team for so many years getting people to read scripture every sunday for so long and what i love about you is you always want to give your best always every rehearsal every potluck is going to be delicious everything you do you want to do your best i'm going to really miss you thank you for everything you did okay <laughs> hi liz it's carol walker um i am really going to miss you you've always been so friendly and positive and you introduced me to the wonders of aquafit so i'm gonna miss you there uh love singing with you in the choir I hope you're really happy and Ross say with uh, your family around you. I know it's a better choice for you. So best of luck and uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Liz, I want to extend my best wishes for you in your new digs in Rosse. My daughter lives in that area. We've just talked about that and she loves it and I know you will too. However, we will miss you. One of the things I want to say is thank you. Uh, the first time we talked was at a Christmas can, uh, party for the choir and you welcomed me with open arms. And one thing I know about you, you wear your heart and shirt sleeve. Thank you for all you've said and done for me. Hey Liz, it's Pat. Um, I will tell you that we're going to miss you in every number of ways. I loved sitting beside you when we were singing alto and soprano together. Um, and you were always willing to come to, to funerals when when I, I consider myself the funeral director, excuse me, Rick, but that's <laughs> <laughs> just sort of seeing people who are willing to come and Liz always was when she could. Um, I hope that you'll be very happy with your with your mom with you and your grandchildren and, and your children close by. And hope you'll come and visit us when you come back to Bedford at some point. Thanks. Hey Liz, it's Peter. You are one of the funniest people I know. Funny and smart. And I will, uh, as, as much as I will miss singing with you, I'll also miss your sense of humor. But I will see you on Facebook and uh, safe travels. All the best. Come visit. Hi Liz, it's Linda Adamson. I'm going to meet for sure, you're always the one with the big smile, and I want to thank you for welcoming me into the choir. And at me, I'm also one person that came to the first Christmas do um, as a newbie, and you were just so generous of, of spirit and so welcoming. And you've always made an effort to reach out to anybody that's new. And I want to say thank you on behalf of all the newbies because um, it really made a difference for me. And um, I just hope you uh, keep giving out your, uh, and people are as welcoming to you as you have been to all of them. Um, I'm sure you will be because you just fit in so well. But um, we're gonna miss you. I'm gonna miss you a lot. Um, you, I, I agree, Peter, She's, you're a smart, um, kind, funny lady, and um, you always brighten up a space, so. Uh, enjoy your new life. You deserve it. Thanks, Linda. That reminds me, I was supposed to say on behalf of Donna Garden, our newest member, thank you, Liz, because you were especially warm and welcoming to Donna. She didn't consider herself a singer, but you made her feel welcome, and she is a singer, and she wanted you to know how much she appreciated you and your kindness when she was new. Let's go to Ann Bootlier now, then Ann Strickland. Ann's got her mic off. And boot here, yeah, just unmute yourself there. <laughs> no, I can do it for you. 
No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and Strickland, why don't you go? Oh, there you go, Ambu. There you got it. Go. Yay. Liz, nobody's going to miss you more than me. You were my choir buddy. We had so many laughs. We had such a good time. You were the best alto I ever sang with. And I was really going to miss you. Hi, Liz. It's Tother Ann and Strickland. And Linda stole my thunder because when I think of you, I think your smiling face. Mm -hmm. Eating all the time, welcoming and open to everyone, and such a talent in the alto section. Always got ideas and got that little shaker going. <laughs> I, I know you've got, we've talked kids before and grandchildren, and I know that that's the draw to uh, New Brunswick and Rossi and wishing you all the best in, in the next next phase of what you're going to be doing. All the best, Anne. Hi, Liz. It's Natasha Mopes here with my two crazy children um, ready for bed, or they should be getting ready for bed soon. Um, I just wanted to... <laughs> Say, uh, and there Felix is making his entrance. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you for always smiling. You greeted every choir practice with a smile, every church service, and you, as others have said, were always very welcoming, especially to myself as I transitioned from uh, the soprano to the alto section, and I learned so much from uh, sitting beside you and also hearing the stories about your family. And uh, I know I'm very appreciative of having my family close by for for my kids, then I just I know how much um, your family will appreciate that and that you will be in your happy place. So um, we will miss you greatly um, and hope that you uh, find Hi. another church community to be part of. Dawson wants to say hello. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Hi Anne. It's Joyce Friedel. Um I'm really going to miss you, Liz. I said, hi, Anne. I meant to say hi, Liz. <laughs> Sorry, old age. <laughs> Liz, I'm really going to miss you. You have just been an amazing, um, not only an amazing member of the alto section, but you're a really gifted person in my eyes because you have such compassion and you have an ability to listen. And not everybody has that. And I think, she, I think, I really think you have a true Christian heart. And you reached out to me when Bill was so sick and um, suddenly there was a certificate for a massage for me that just magically appeared. And it was from you and you hardly knew me, but you just have made a lasting impression. Um, you're an amazing person and any congregation you join is going to have a really powerful addition. And you're just a lovely person. We will miss you greatly. Hi Liz, it's Debbie, and uh, just want to say hey, that we're really going to miss your alto voice and your leadership, miss your percussion, um, but I'm so glad that you get to be here and uh, moving back home, that, that's going to be great for you, for sure, we know that. And thank you for everything you've always done for us. And uh, I remember going to a couple of uh, Christmas parties at your place. And thank you for opening up your house to us. We're going to miss you. Take care. Hi, Liz. It's Diane. I'm going to miss you so much. You're such a smart, intelligent, talented lady. It was an honor to be your friend. I um, wish you all the best in Rasse. I'm going to miss strumming with you and singing with you and just being in your presence. So all the best in Rasse. Liz, I didn't get to know you really well, but on behalf of all the choir and all those who aren't able to be here, we wish you and Paul all the very best in your new life in Rasse. Very well, Liz. We'll miss you. Do this away. Love you.